little bit about myself. So I did my training at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. I moved my newly minted fiance out to San Diego. I did my fellowship in GI UC San Diego. It was great. We loved it there. I was going to live there forever. We had two kids. My wife said, no way. And so the next year, I went out to Columbia University in New York, where I did an advanced fellowship. There I learned about Barrett's esophagus, treatment for Barrett's esophagus, the U.S. nurse and peace and palliative care. Basically, all about advanced endoscopy. Family reasons came out here. I've been here for about six months. I've loved it since. Um, I've been a group of diabetes disease consultants. My partners are excellent. Um, you might know some of them in um, the hospital. From there, let's start. So, basically, this talk is about heartburn. So, when is heartburn more than heartburn? When should you seek out your doctor and when should you just say, you know, roll your tongue should be okay? <clears throat> so, here we have two gentlemen. The first on the left is a young male in college. He complains of heartburn about one to two times per month. It occurs usually after he has pizza or pop and gets relief with over the counter toms or roll aid. This patient I'm not worried about. Um, he's young, infrequent heartburn. I probably would tell him to play off the pizza and pop and gets good relief with antacids. Um, don't need to see a doctor. The person on the right is a little bit older. He's in his middle age, complains of heartburn daily, gets gap relief with over the counter medications. Rolates and Tums doesn't do it, so he uses things like Nexium or Pilocyte. He's had symptoms for over 10 years, and he's becoming more frequent. This patient we're more worried about having complications of um, gastroesophageal reflux, as we've been talking about. So remember, heartburn's a symptom. Okay? So when you say I have chest pain, that's a symptom. You have heartburn, it's a burning sensation, you usually have the gastric. GERD is the condition of the disease. GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disorder. So, symptoms of GERD. So most people, a typical one is chronic heartburn. Other people have trouble sleeping at night. Classic is I lay down at night and I feel this water dry sensation in the back of my throat. It feels like burning. Something's not feeling like I get gas and bloating. People realize they have food limitations. So I can't eat that spicy sausage. Or I can't eat the tough guy for office pizza. Coffee. So a lot of patients would complain of chronic cough. They see an EMT doctor for it. The EMT doctor says, it's not your sinuses. It could just be acid reflux. So one in two Americans every month will complain of GERD symptoms. One in five every week. That's over $3,000 empl um, per employee annually. So it's a huge healthcare burden. It's a reason why the PPI medications, Nexium, Phylocyte, Mimpazone, they're one of the top 10 most prescribed medications in the US. So 3.3 million Americans have their esophagus. We're going to define a little bit here. That's a lot of people. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana. It's probably close to New York City. So, GERD. What is it? So we know it's a soft fuel reflux disease. What causes it? I'm going to add another one here. How do we diagnose it? What are the treatment options? What are the outcomes of treated? And what is the progression of untreated? That's what we really care about. Does this progress to anything scary that should be worried about? So this shows you. Here's your esophagus. There's your stomach. Just like the lower esophagus has a sphincter, which is a muscle. Just like any muscle, your esophagus squeezes food down. That muscle relaxes that spoon in the stomach and pulls it up. As you get older, as we'll talk about the risk factors, the esophagus starts to relax. And when it relaxes, it's easier for acid from the stomach to hit the esophagus and cause symptoms or gastroesophageal reflux disease. So it causes obesity, diet, so things like alcohol, things like chocolate, um, spicy foods. They all cause the lower esophageal sphincter to relax. Age, as you get older, just like any muscle, starts relaxing. Smoking and some medications. I'm going to switch here to talk about the Bravo study. This is how we diagnose gastroesophageal reflux disease. So the Bravo study, you know, when patients have typical symptoms of GERD, so if you come in and say, I have heartburn every day, especially the spicy foods, we try them on a PPI drug, which is Nexium, Prilosec, um, and Topazole. If it's refractory to that, we do an endoscopy. When you do an endoscopy, you can see evidence of acid reflux. You get inflammation of your distal esophagus. The pathologist will look at the biopsies and say it has evidence of acid reflux here. However, some patients don't have these typical symptoms. For example, if you have a chronic cough. In that case, that's when a bravo could be helpful. A bravo is the only test for loss for determining abnormal acid exposure and symptoms associated with reflux episode. So if you came to me and said, listen, I've had a chronic cough, I feel it's gas and bloating. We do an endoscopy, everything looks normal. And you're wondering, is this acid reflux or not? This is where a bravo can be helpful. I'm going to go through that. This is kind of a bravo sy uh, system. So basically, it's a catheter. And when I put the catheter down, we put the little probe in your esophagus. And it tells us a few things. Basically, it sends data to a little wireless box that you hold. 
what happens is it tells me, yes, you have acid reflux. It measures the pH of your esophagus and it measures events. You have acid reflux. And on that box, you have a little clicker when you have symptoms of chest pain or heartburn or bloating. Um, you press the button. So now I look at it and I say, yes, you have acid reflux. Your acid reflux correlates when you push the button for heartburn. Then the next two days, you take something for acid reflux, like tongue or rolling or um, prolacin. And then we can see, yes, you have acid reflux, yes, it correlates with your symptoms, but the next two days it looks like it's suppressed adequately or not adequately. That's some of the and that's what it looks like in the esophagus, just a little probe there. It falls off on its own after a few days, goes through the body, you never see it. I've had patients say, should I look forward to my stool? I say, no, if you do find it, don't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so the treatment for uh, esophageal reflux disease. So there's lifestyle changes, there's medications, there's surgery. And then there's always, you know, I'll watch and hope it just goes away on its own. Lifestyle changes, so limit the trigger foods. Right? Less caffeine, less alcohol, no more chocolate. You eat slowly, lose weight, stop smoking. Avoid eating three hours before bed. And I tell all my patients, sleep as we climb up 45 degrees at least. What that does is help manage your reflux symptoms. A lot of times that's enough, a lot of times it's not. There's lots of medications. There's the antacids, the Maylox, Rolates, Tums. That's for a young male who gets it once or two times a month, only needs really spicy food. Immediate relief, it's great. There used to be the pH receptor blockers, things like Zantac, Pepsin, and Tagamin. And these were what we had for the longest time until the PPIs came. And like I said, these are the top 10 most prescribed medications in the US. They're Nexium, Prevacid, Prilosic, Acid, Fats, Oxymol. Um, for some people, they take the PPI medication twice a day and they don't get relief from it. We do the Bravo set, we have documented acid reflux causing your symptoms, and the PPI is not help. For those patients, a bundification will be helpful. Basically, what the surgeon does is he takes the stomach and he wraps it around the esophagus. So he takes the loop of the stomach and wraps it around the esophagus, making that sphincter tighter. It's a common surgery, it's very effective, it's minimally invasive. There's typical surgical risk of bleeding and infection, but those are very more commonly, patients complain of bloating because now if it's too tight and you swallow air, you feel like I have to belch, but I can't escape that air. Sometimes a wrap will come undone, so after a few years, it slips down and the surgeon has to do it again. For the most part, it's really good surgery. There's a new thing called a TIF, which is basically an endoscopic complication, so there's no cutting involved. It's effective and non invasive. It's uh, relatively new, more data is coming out on it, but it seems to be really effective. So the complications, well, what's, let's say you've had long-standing heartburn, like the patient that we talked about, 55-year-old male with obesity, long-standing daily, takes a PPI, still has some. What happens if he just lives in the Does he need an endoscopy? So what happens is you get acid reflux, and that acid tears the esophagus. That's what we call rosin esophagitis. When you get ulcer formation with the esophagitis, you get a stricture. Strictures are basically scar tissue that starts scarring down the esophagus. And when that happens, patients usually complain of trouble swallowing. They eat a piece of steak and says it gets stuck right here. Then we get to a Barrett's esophagus. So Barrett's esophagus is basically when the acid hits the lining of the esophagus, the cells start to change. Okay? The cells now start changing, they start looking at the stomach to The cells keep changing, they start turning into things what we call low grade dysplasia. And from there it progresses to high grade dysplasia, and from there it turns into cancer. Here's what Barrett's esophagus looks like. Here's the right here stomach mucosa. The esophageal mucosa is supposed to be this nice gray color right here. Over time, you get more and more acid reflux. After you get esophagitis for a long time, you can tell that the lining starts to strip away, starts to look like muscle, or like stomach layer. This highlights it. This is what a normal esophagus looks like. You get this nice gray columnar epithelium, and here's the stomach. And here's the top of the gastric folds. We call it the GE junction. It looks nice and clean. This is the rose of esophagitis. People with heartburn have of the lower esophagus. You treat them with a uh, Prilosec or Pepsin and that will clear up. But over a long time, you get ferrets. So you can see that that uh, salmon colored mucosa is now encroaching up where it's not supposed to be. After that, you start getting nodules, what we call dysplasia. When you get dysplasia, you get cancer. That's what esophageal cancer looks like. So esophageal adenocarcinoma is one of the few cancers that have actually been increasing in incidence over the years. Colorectal cancer, you made a little bit of headway. Lung cancer has been slowly creeping up. But look at esophageal cancer. Really, really high. So good news.
If you have Barrett's esophagus, you don't have cancer yet. Okay? We treat that like we do any precancerous condition, breast masses, colon polyps, and skin leaking. A colon polyp's not cancer. Okay? A colon polyp has the ability to turn into cancer. There's no guarantee it could progress to cancer. So what do we do? Remove it before it turns into cancer. If you have a skin mold, your doctor says, he doesn't rush and says, let's remove your arm. He says, watch the skin mold. The skin mold starts to change. They say, you know what? It's starting to scare us. Take it out before it turns into melanoma. So once you have melanoma, you're looking at things like chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. And that's how we treat Barrett's. When you have Barrett's, you look at it. You could surveillance it. So people have short second Barrett's, and you just have a few inches or a few centimeters of uh, that salmon colored mucosa. We can watch it. We do that by endoscopy every three to five years. Biopsy. We make sure it's not progressing just like that skin. Mold. We make sure you don't have things like dysplasia. If you have a nodule, we take out the nodule. We do something called endoscopic mucosa resection, where you don't do surgery. I go down the scope, I put a little band around it, and I just remove it. The pathologist looks at that, but I remove tissue, and he says there's no cancer here. It looks like dysplasia. And finally, we ablate the tissue. Okay, ablation has been shown to be really helpful in this situation. Intestinal metaplasia is what we call favorites. When you do an ablation, which I'll show you in one minute here, you do a radio frequency ablation, 98.4% of patients get treated. Low grade dysplasia and high grade dysplasia, over 90% are treated. Okay. Think about that. If you have high grade dysplasia, which is a step right before cancer, you can get a simple procedure to ablate the tissue. Don't have to worry about the decrease your risk of cancer. Great. So, here's a standard endoscopy. I do an endoscopy. I see the GE junction here, right? It's supposed to be down here. Here's where the esophagus ends, here's where the stomach begins. But, because all this mucosa is looking like stomach, this is all Barrett's right there, okay? And through that, you take biopsy, you can surveillance, make sure there's no display each other. If you do have display, you put a catheter down here, you measure it, and we deliver some energy. And that energy burns the tissue around. And we get this nice gray color here, which we call coagulum, which will just be scraped off. We come down here, we blade the other tissue. That sloughs off. And later, when you come back in a few weeks, or four to six weeks, you can see that we have a little bit of area right there that still looks like Barrett, so we can touch it up. And here's a good example. Here's the Barrett's esophagus. There's a normal.